Hello and welcome back to the Angerati studio here at the uh, EU Sustainable Energy Week. I'm now joined by uh, George from the University of Cyprus. George, firstly, welcome. Thank you, thank you for making the time to be here. And we were talking a little bit off air before we uh, started the interview and uh, some of the things we touched on uh, are about the uh, uh, case of removing subsidies from tariffs and, and, and things like that. I'm not going to go on too much uh, because you, uh, you're also part of a very interesting uh, project uh, uh, around PVs and how they can work. I'll hand the floor over to you. Tell us a little bit about what, uh, the work you've done and, uh, and what you've found. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us, first of all. We, ha we ha have been coordinating this project called PVNet, which is funded by the MET program at the rate of 1.3 million euros. And essentially, we would like to investigate the best way forward in terms of the penetration of photovoltaics by resorting to other market policies rather than feeding tariffs. This is so because in countries in the Mediterranean, and especially Cyprus and so on, the cost of electricity from photovoltaics is much lower compared to the cost of electricity from conventional sources. And as a result, feeding tariffs are not needed, but what is needed is an effective energy policy in order to allow the penetration of photovoltaics into the energy mix. And this is why we started this project. Essentially, we want to look at the so-called net metering as an alternative market policy for the uptake and the penetration of photovoltaics into the energy mix. And the project essentially consists of six partners from six Mediterranean countries. And the whole idea is to develop pilots in the countries to study the data from the prosumers and develop an optimized net metering policy for each country. So if, if I can um, ask you to explain, uh, explain that a little bit, because uh, the thought process behind feed and tariffs and they've been used in Germany, is that you need some sort of subsidized mechanism in order to kickstart the uptake of photovoltaics. Um, uh, again, so there's been a thread through all of the interviews that, we, uh, uh, that we've had. In some way, shape or form, most people have said, look, we need to move away from this type of model uh, it creates an imbalance. It, it, it doesn't let the tariff market do what the tariff market should do. So where, where are you guys in terms of perhaps suggesting a different model? Can, can we go into that a little bit? I absolutely agree with you. Uh, let me take as an example Cyprus. Of course, feeding tariff is important at the initial stages of the market development. But right now we are in the situation where it costs less to produce your energy from a PV system than to buy it from your grid. So what has to happen now is to make this sustainable. And in order to make this sustainable, you have to move towards the open market. And net metering is a transition to this open market. Essentially, you want to take into consideration all the costs associated with the distribution, transmission, production of electricity, and incorporate all that into your model in order to be able to have like with like, to compare like with like in terms of the tariffs. And Cyprus is a, an, a very good example because we have high electricity prices from conventional sources and lower electricity prices right now from PV. But you need to make sure that you compare like with like with PV. You have the cost of production. You need to take into consideration all the other costs associated with the transmission, distribution, storage, and so on in order to make sure that you have a sustainable market. So we have two issues in my opinion. The grid integration, you have to make sure that you have a good, a good enough grid to allow the penetration of photovoltaics and to make it sustainable, but you also need a good market tool in order to, be, to allow competition uh, in the market. And when you're, uh, when you're talking about grid integration, because this, this, is, this is the other debate, because uh, conceptually, uh, people could go off grid. Uh, they can say, "Look, I've I've got my PV. I've got a storage solution." And now with storage, I think we're we're uh, a few years away of a tipping point of affordability. But th there is already talk of people being sort of islands, uh, and that the grid connection is like either a last resort connection and then so on. 
so there are two points here. One is, you know, how do you pay for the grid because you may need it, you know, uh, at, uh, at some point, and also the utility business model. The utility business model at the moment is predicated on selling energy. If suddenly everybody is kind of positive or, you know, the income stream drops, where's the business model? I think uh, you hit the nail on the head. You need to, first of all, you said that the grid is a last resort, but uh, if in order to have this grid available, somebody has to pay to make sure the grid is available. So all these, ta all these tariffs and all these costs have to be into the, into the uh, electricity tariff model. And this is what we are trying to look at now. As the penetration increases, you need to start looking at storage. You need to start looking at other issues which have to be incorporated into the, into the tariff. So this is one important point. The second important point is that you have to change the way the grid is operating right now. It has to be a smart grid. It has to allow the participation of the consumers and the, produ and the, con and the producers, the so-called prosumers as well, in order to make sure that they all work in the same direction and that there is bi-directional flow of information and so on. So there are two issues, grid, and market, in my opinion, that have to be sorted out before we have much higher penetration of PV and before we stop the growth of PV. If we don't deal with these two issues, I think we will have a bottleneck later on with respect to renewables and photovoltaics. So if we could laser in on, uh, on those two issues, and uh, what you're saying is corroborated with a recent, you know, we did a recent webinar and uh, uh, I think it was Jonathan from Airgrid was saying much the same thing. And so we, we got to make a decision about what we want our network to do. Do we want it to be resilient, scalable, reliable, and fit for purpose? Or, uh, or, or do we want it to be uh, a, a market-driven net network, so there's that abstraction of the network. So let's deal with the network side of things uh, for a start. Um, I don't know how far you are into this research, but can you exp just give us some of the models that you're looking at in terms of creating an environment where people are happy to contribute towards the existence of the network rather than a, a, uh, a different attitude when say, actually, I don't need it. I think, I think uh, the I don't need it attitude is, is wrong in my opinion. The grid has to evolve and the grid has to facilitate the interplay between the different consumers and producers and prosumers in order to allow this. Uh, it, it's a bit like the internet. You will have production, consumption everywhere and you have to be able to manage all that. So the grid has to be able to evolve, to become smart in order to uh, be able to allow all that. But there are issues such as security, issues such as management and all that that have to be introduced into the grid as well, telecommunication, ICT and all that. So the grid in the end is a very important point that has to be sorted out before we move on. But there's also an issue of capital investment. This, sure. this, the, the, you, know, you, you can't build the smart grid without the upfront capital investment. So how do you convince someone to put in that capital investment and where are the returns? Are we saying that we need to move to a model where there is a proportional flat rate for you to be connected, which has got nothing to do with how much you consume or produce, it, that is just a connection charge, and that should go direct to the end consumer rather th than being hidden in, in tariffs? I'm not sure about the answer, but mm. personally I would want to see a grid where you pay for the usage of the grid, and the more you use it, the more you pay. And I think that would be fairer for everyone. It's not fair to impose a charge or a tax on everyone at a flat rate in order for some people to utilize the grid. So let's take, for example, photovoltaics. If I have the net metering scheme, you have to incorporate a certain distribution charge, a certain charge that will allow, for example, the usage of the grid, that will allow for the, for the reserves and so on. So this has to be paid by the people who own the PV system because they are the ones that you, they are using this facility and not by everyone. So you don't want to subsidize something. You want to in, in, induce a fee which is going to be based on the usage of the grid. Now that's my personal opinion though. I'm not sure if this is reflected in the policy and so on.
you're you're entitled to your personal opinion and and, and you're <laughs> you're in this space so you're a, as well placed as anybody else to uh, to have that so can we look at the other side of it which is the utility business model uh how do you create a win-win situation where where a utility is um you know and 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 some in, in some instances they're happy to i think at the moment do that but where you have island situations like you know and physical islands like like, like cyprus where there there could be a chance where everything just completely tips and the old utility business model would literally produce very little or low roi how do you create a win-win situation there? The way we see it right now, if you look at the electricity prices from photovoltaics and the electricity prices from conventional sources, there is a gap there. And essentially, you want to occupy this gap. This gap will be occupied by the uh, people that will benefit will be the prosumers, but the utility has a gap that can benefit from. And this is where we, what we are trying to do, we try to optimize and to I essentially distribute this gap between the prices so that everyone is happy. In the case of Cyprus, this gap is huge because of the fact that the le conventional electricity prices are 23, 24 euros cents per kilowatt hour, and the production of electricity from PV is less than 10. So there is a huge gap there where it, have, it has to be occupied. And that's what we are trying to do, to optimize, going back to the project, we want to optimize net metering so that all the costs are, are well reflected into the prices and so that the utilities are happy with this arrangement in order to allow the further implementation of photovoltaics and to be part of this new situation that is arising. So are you saying we need to create a market that where the, tar the tariff or the electricity price also reflects the generation source because photovoltaics, we know, are intermittent. Uh, you know, let's not keep repeating that. We're talking to an audience that understands that issue. Uh, but you then, in order to balance out that intermittency, you need rampable energy sources. Exactly. And then the, uh, are you saying that we need to reward those energy Absolutely. sources in a different way at a different Absolutely. price point? Absolutely. And to place the right value on these, on these services in order to be to be all accounted for in the final tariff. And then when we have that sort of model, that's when you can actually af reflect behavior change, can't you? Where Absolutely. you can say, look, don't turn on your washing machines Absolutely. at night. Demand side management. Yeah. And then you develop dynamic tariffs, and this is one of the issues we are looking at. Develop dynamic tariffs, and then use demand side management so that the consumers are part of the game as well and they can see the benefit as well. So would you say that dynamic tariffs are the absolute key to all of this? Uh, they are they are important, but there are many issues that have to be sorted out. They are not the only issue. Storage, for example, other issues as well, behavioral change. I, it's not just you have to put together the puzzle in order to make it work, because if you just extract dynamic tariffs, you might get the opposite effect. And we've seen examples in Italy, for example, where they used dynamic tariffs, but in the end it had the opposite effect because it was not well planned and it didn't reflect the behavior of the consumers and the prosumers at the time. So it has to be a feedback mechanism whereby you look at, uh, you instigate a reaction, you look at it and you plan it, you go back, you have the feedback and then you change it in order to refine it and make it better. And, uh, and that sort of feedback loop is uh, kind of maybe a bit counterintuitive to the energy industry that likes to do things in yeah. 10 years and, and <laughs> things like that. Uh, uh, listen, it's, it's been a genuine pleasure talking to you. Thank you for coming to share with us. Um, uh, and also, th there's a second part uh, uh, of this interview where we're going to go into uh, get into the guts of the technical issues uh, around net metering and, uh, and things like that. So please do uh, uh, look, that, uh, look that up. And if we've done our job right, there should be a link below this video to pointing you to that interview as well. So go ahead and watch that as well. Thank you for, again for watching.